<laughs> okay, so uh, now we go back to our uh, futures uh, contracts that we were studying. So please remember the. what we were studying here, the important things we studied here about uh, the three important dates, position, last position, first position date, first notice date and uh, first and last delivery date. You really have to be more concerned about the last delivery date if you are making delivery. Okay, so conceptually understand it, although you will not be required to actually, um, I mean, you may not be affected in, in, in all the contracts in this particular project, but understand the concept when you're studying futures. Okay, so first position date, it's the first date on which we have already covered this yesterday make sure you understand this okay so therefore from this we have a rule that follows that if you don't want to take um, physical delivery if you're a speculator okay you're going to be functioning as a speculator okay even though you uh, in certain cases you may get a hedger designation but we will assume that you're a speculator so and uh, if you uh, in any case if you want to avoid even if you're a, as a hedger you want to avoid the main thing is that This is the main thing, okay? If this is your objective, that you don't want to be ha hassle because physical delivery is a big hassle. You have to take, if it's cattle futures, you have to take the cattle, you have to sell them in a physical auction. If it's oil, you have to take delivery of the oil. That means you're holding the, you're holding the oil in an oil storage facility. You have to sell it to somebody. That means you're dealing in physical oil. Obviously here, it's much easier to trade, okay? Because you can just, with two clicks, you can get out of a position, all right? On a in a in a futures uh, in a financial contract trading sense, you can get out with a of a position in two clicks. But if you're dealing with physical positions, it's much harder to get rid of them. Okay, the market is much less liquid. So all these oil cargoes and all that there is a fairly active market, but it's not it's nothing it's never going to be as smooth as this. Here, if I want to buy euro uh, euros against dollars, I just uh, two clicks and I can buy the amount. Okay, so whereas transacting in physical amounts is much uh, much more complicated. So therefore. Uh, you may not want to take many people don't want to deal do want to be hassled with physical delivery so the rule basically is that if you're a holder of a short position okay you have to close before the uh, last trading date if you're a holder of a long position which is more dicey actually uh, you have to take it before if you combine these two read the notices here neat what is saying so you have to basically get out if you're if you're if you're holding a long position you have to either square that position or you have to get, take delivery against the position right okay and delivery is also aware of squaring the position so if you have that now if you don't want to take physical delivery there are two concerns that you have one is the last trading date because obviously after the last trading date you can't trade right you can't trade after the last trading date and also after the first notice date you may or may not get assigned but there is a risk that you might get assigned because remember what is first notice date these are all in your notes what is the first notice date the first notice date which is actually wrongly defined in your book that exchange notifies the holder of long position of delivery intent which means the first notice date as soon as the first notice date comes you are on notice in the sense any any day the exchange may come and catch hold of any long uh, 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 trader any trader who's long futures the exchange can randomly catch hold of him and tell him that you are going to be delivered against you told them yes sir but sir please sir manager is like also when we on hand mic we have for meeting here so where is the hand mic we have a hand mic no okay we'll just live with it never mind never mind we'll just live with it okay okay relax okay so is this clear that if the first notice day is also dangerous because after the first notice day yeah. you are uh, you could be assigned you don't know because it's not in your hand the exchange is going to randomly select any wrong position holder and assign the contract the, because uh, on the basis of the short seller those who have been sh uh, those who are short after first position date those who are short are already telling the exchange that i want to settle this through physical delivery right so the exchange already knows that there are certain physical deliveries to be made that let's say in the case of 10 contracts there will be physical deliveries so now the exchange is the exchange is not going to sit with the physical delivery the clearing house will not take the delivery the clearing house is always everything is uh, in and out okay they, they square everything okay so the exchange is now going to hunt for 10 long traders to whom they are going to make those deliveries they are going to assign those deliveries are you following what is happening okay so physical delivery is going to happen because 10 short position holders uh, have told the exchange that we want to make physical delivery so now the exchange has to find 10 contracts held by long traders 
against uh, to whom they're going to assign those deliveries and that will they'll be doing that randomly so if you're a long trader and uh, after the first position date you're running a risk that you could be assigned okay are you following right if you don't want to deal with physical delivery that's not something that you want obviously you don't want that kind of outcome right so uh, therefore you should get, so therefore the first obviously you have to get out if you're a long trader you have to get out uh, before the last trading date even a short trader also you have to get out before the last trading date because after that you can't trade okay so and if, if, if you're a short position trader who if you're a short if you have a short position who and you don't have any intention of getting into physical delivery to settle it then you have to get out before the last trading date okay and if you're a long position trader you have to also get out before there's no question of you deciding to make delivery you can sit and wait for delivery but you can't it's not in your control so you also better get out before the last trading date or you have to get out before the first notice date so therefore if you combine the last two conditions these two conditions if you combine you have to get out here okay prior to last trading date or first notice date whichever is earlier are you following the logic yes if you're a long trader and you want do not want to get into physical delivery you have to get out either before first whichever comes earlier last trading date or first notice date this is clear logic is clear to everyone okay yes okay so this is just about delivery uh, some of the points that you needed to know about delivery okay and these definitions first notice dates uh, this 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 is this link actually this is the better link uh, this is actually directly from the CME website so anyway you see any conflict between what is written in a book and what is written on the exchange website you go with what is written on the exchange website okay so this is the correct definition of first notice date uh, which is there on the CME exchange website okay so these are important terms that you need to know with respect to delivery we have also covered the other point yesterday already that is what is the settlement method is it cash settled or financially settled okay or is it physical delivery okay so that is another thing so any futures contract that you are studying you one of the things you have to look up for a look out for is to find out what is the settlement method okay is it through physical delivery is physical delivery allowed or is it something which is as we saw in the case of the S&P 500 futures that physical delivery is not allowed it has to be financially settled okay so they will look at the value of the spot uh, at the time of the settle uh, last trading day of the futures contract they look at what the spot value is okay for the same uh, base asset and they will settle against that so if you have a higher futures price okay and you are long and you are having to sell it you will have a loss okay so if you are long at a particular so whatever the spot value is the spot value of the contract is of the asset is they will compare it with that and they'll settle it financially so these are two aspects of uh, this is an aspect of settlement method okay and which we studied yesterday and then there's the aspect of delivery so we go back to uh, this is we already studied this asset is obvious contract size delivery arrangements uh, we already discussed that delivery months you saw that that there are many many different months that are trading okay um, price quotes price limits position limits we already discussed all this okay this is the point that we did not discuss yesterday just read this here convergence of futures to spot price uh, this difference is called the um, the difference in this will there's a term which is not mentioned in the book okay which we'll discuss here i'm just going to write it in your futures notes so in this notes in this note uh, um, for your for, for your uh, study which is in your uh, folder i'm just writing down particular notes on uh, some points which are not mentioned in the book okay what is it? this is also coming this is garvit he's talking on the phone okay some voice is coming <laughs> oh some there yes okay very strange okay so uh, futures <laughs> because we have seen cases where in the past where students were actually they would like slip in a big class like two sections like the the first year classes some students would like slip down under the desk and talk on their mobile phones <laughs> and uh, you would uh, you would hear a you know murmuring sound but you couldn't figure out who was actually talking okay so so uh, what what are we talking about? Um, futures, uh, either futures minus cash or cash minus futures, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So uh, this is called the uh, cash. Uh, sometimes it's called the basis 
or this is called the cash futures basis so we should write it like this this is a term that you need to know basis okay so basis is a term that is used in finance for a lot of differences okay difference between this and that so this term is called the cash futures basis which is at any point of time if you look at the futures prices okay and here you can see um, if we go directly uh, from your um, maybe we can see it on oh my god they have blocked bar chart oh. money money control is also blocked no no i'll tell them i'll tell them to but actually the problem is that you know i i figure out only uh, like when i open it here and then i find I'll send them a mail. I'll send them a mail again on this. So we'll just write this down here. I'll just write them as a as a reminder. But so many things are actually uh, blocked. Bar chart. Uh, bar chart. Yeah, but the thing with VPNs, don't they always slow down the traffic? VPNs don't slow down traffic. There are certain which do certain don't. Okay, so what is a good VPN? So like Siphon, it's a free way and Skyzip is Siphon has S I P H O N. P S I P H O N. Okay. So I'll write it. So according to you, Siphon is a v VPN which does not slow down traffic. Yes. This is the only reason I don't use, uh, I mean, uh, basically I can just use my Geo. But extension as well named Skyzip. You can also use that. It's Skyzip. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Okay. So, uh, so the term that you're learning here is basis. Okay. So this difference between the cash price, I just wanted to show you because on bar chart you can see the cash prices, but unfortunately now we can't load bar chart. But here, if you see, uh, if we just look at energy once again, um, you know, directly gone into this. But the point is basically that there would be a futures price. And there will be a cash price because the futures price is for a particular maturity as you can see here this futures price now the crude oil is uh, if we can make this is this big enough the can you guys see at the back yes sir you can read all the december 16 19 yes, sir. yes you can read okay it's better on your on your whatsapp looks better <laughs> okay uh, okay so we don't need to increase the font size but uh, you can see here that the um, yeah so right now the the crude oil the front contract is actually the jan 20 uh, 2020 contract okay so but there will also be a so this is 57 85 86 so it's possible that the spot price maybe is something like 57 so if you are buying spot cargoes of crude oil okay uh, those are probably 57 okay and the futures price the front month futures price is the the first month is called the front month sometimes okay so uh, or they'll just call it first second month etc and so you can see here this is 57.85 and there will be a cash price let's say the cash price is uh, 57 okay so that is for buying physical cargoes of oil okay which is quite an actively traded segment so uh, now so the difference between those two here we'll say the cash futures basis is uh, 85 cents okay because the spot price is 57 and the futures price is 85 okay 57.85 so it will say we say the futures cash futures basis against the first month is usually the, by default it is coded against the first month so we'll say the basis is 85 cents that's all it's just a term that you need to know current cash futures basis okay which is um, yeah okay so just the ca uh, the term that uh, we wanted to add to your uh, where did I write? Oh, it was written in your futures notes. Okay, right. So the cat, the term that you've learned, this is called the cash futures basis. And so what we are learning here is the convergence of the cash, uh, uh, of the cash and futures prices. So spot price is basically we also call it cash because we are contrasting it with the futures contract, which is a derivative contract. So anytime we are contrasting a spot price, okay or a, ca a value cash price against the futures price in both cases we'll refer it against any derivative price we will refer it refer to it as a cash market okay so therefore that's why i said cash futures basis okay normally the term that is used in industry is that it's not spot futures basis because uh, cash is 
here used in the sense of cash market as opposed to derivative markets which is the futures being a derivative contract okay is a derivative market so so you're comparing these two so here you can see this basically what they're trying to show you is that as you get close to maturity the two prices have to converge okay so the near uh, near month futures delivery uh, the futures contract and the spot uh, price they two the two of them have to converge okay because uh, otherwise there will be op opportunities for arbitrage although we have not yet defined what is classical riskless arbitrage but i think you've got a flavor of it in some previous discussions so just try to understand what they're saying here that there are two possibilities let's say if the futures price is higher than the spot price okay very close to maturity let's say we just artificially twist this diagram and if we say that uh, what is the first example they've taken yeah the futures is above the spot price during the delivery period okay so what happens or even very close to the the, the first delivery date so are you able to follow this because you know that the, this is only true for uh, where you can deliver against the underlying contract. Okay, even in the case of financial futures, because the settlement will happen against the financial futures. But here they have given the example for uh, uh, against the spot value of the of the contract. Uh, but here they have given the example for physical delivery contracts. Okay, are you able to follow what he's saying here? Because the futures contract in cases where physical delivery is allowed, okay, then essentially the futures contract is just a path to the physical asset, okay, because you can either buy the futures contract, you can buy if you want to get hold of the physical asset, you can buy the futures contract and not wait and not close it out before first notice date or for last trading date which means you are assured that you will be there will be a delivery against you okay so therefore well, that is one way so you can just wait for delivery to be made against your long position so that's one way of getting hold of the physical contract of the physical asset the other way of getting hold of the physical asset is to directly buy it in the market directly buy a physical asset in the market yeah no the first part you're not clear about the first part so the first part is that if you uh, if you buy the futures contract okay and you don't square your so you are long a futures contract now you have not squared it before first notice date you have not squared it till the last trading date also all right so then you have an outstanding contract okay so in this case the, the, you are likely to get delivered against that contract because you have not so because anybody the short position holders who are making delivery okay so you will get delivered so eventually what is the consequence that the, the physical asset ends up in your hands because you bought the futures contract you didn't square it and so you got delivered so the physical asset ends up in your hand yes. so that's the outcome that we are looking for that i want the physical asset to end up in my hands so one way for that to happen is to uh, buy the indirect way of doing it is to buy the futures contract and wait to be delivered in, against that position that is the indirect way of doing it okay but the direct way of doing it is if i want the physical asset and if it's obviously being traded in the market there is a spot market for that i can just go into the physical market and buy the uh, physical asset so there are two ways of achieving the same thing okay so if you are you following is everyone clear okay yes, sir. although only she asked the question i'm sure many other people are not clear but people are not in the habit of asking questions okay so uh, now uh, is this point clear now there are two ways of achieving the same outcome that you can either buy the physical asset in the physical market or you can buy the futures contract and wait for to, uh, to be delivered on the futures contract so there's also an indirect way of getting hold of the physical asset so remember what we studied in synthetic when we studied synthetic positions for options okay so the questions came up as to why do we bother with synthetics okay the reason you bother with synthetics is that there are two ways of achieving the same outcome then the two of them should cost the same otherwise there's an opportunity for arbitrage because you can take the one which is low cost less and uh, achieve that out you can buy that uh, con a set of instruments okay which help you to achieve the same outcome and the ones which cost high, uh, more you will sell that and then you pocket the difference because there's no risk because the, the outcomes are the same are you able to follow yes sir. okay so if it is a future uh, if it's we are talking about a few physical oil cargo okay then if there's an oil futures contract which is trading the first example they've given is that the futures price is above the spot price so what you see here read what this is said read what this says here okay. 
so you simultaneously because in this case what are we saying we are saying the futures price very close to delivery okay very close to the uh, the start of the delivery period the futures price is just another way of uh, getting hold of the physical asset the futures contract is just another way of getting hold of the physical asset so if I see that the futures contract is much more expensive compared to the spot price of the physical asset the same physical asset which will be delivered into the futures contract which is deliverable into the futures contract right if I see that it has a, a much lower the spot price the physical price is much lower okay but the futures price is much higher but if you are very very close to the start of the delivery period then these are actually essentially the same things because if I buy the futures contract, uh, you know, if I buy the futures contract, I can get hold of the uh, of the uh, physical asset indirectly because it will be delivered against my long position if I don't close it out. Yes, are you following? So what we are trying to say is that very close to the delivery period, okay, or within the delivery period, there is uh, the two are actually the essentially the same thing, okay, because you can switch one for the other. Here what they're talking about is an example where if you see the example where so there are only two possibilities either the futures is above the cash or the cash is above the futures there are only two possibilities and what we are saying is that eventually the cash futures basis has to go to zero okay and this is what they're talking about the convergence okay what are they showing you here this is the convergence that they're showing you as we approach the delivery period okay that, that the two will converge okay so what are they saying here the first example is where the futures is higher than the cash okay so since you are saying that essentially the main thing to understand is that close to the very close to the delivery period this these two are essentially the same things since they're essentially the same outcome the same outcome basically both are roads to the physical asset okay either the selling or the buying of the physical asset okay so in this case what are you doing here essentially you are uh, buying the, the the two are the same you're trading the two as the same and you see that the futures contract and one of them has a higher price so the law of one price which we have not yet discussed classical riskless arbitrage properly okay because it's slightly longer uh, discussion but the point here is that if two items are the same they can't have this uh, two different prices right so if you see for instance any product uh, let's say if you see that uh, sugar is selling in one market in uh, say south delhi for say let's say 40 rupees a kilo and it's the same grade of sugar and you are able to buy and sell at the same price if you are able to buy and sell at the same price okay and then you are able to uh, transport that uh, if, assume that let's there's no transport cost okay uh, if you are and that same market is selling and the same product is selling in north delhi at 50 rupees a kilo so what will people do since you can buy and sell at those same prices okay that is both the bid and the offer so it's a choice price so they will buy the sugar from south delhi and sell it in north delhi right because the price in north delhi is much higher and two items can't have the same price are you able to follow this simple so we are actually discussing classical risk plus arbitrage without the transportation cost or even if we add let's say five rupees per kilo the transportation cost so the south delhi price is 40 rupees a kilo all right and uh, the uh, North Delhi price is 50 rupees a kilo. So actually what we are saying is that th there is still an opportunity to make money because you can buy it at 40 rupees, pay 5 rupees for transport cost to North Delhi and then sell it in the North Delhi markets at 50 rupees. So you are still making 5 rupees. So that's what we are saying. So eventually what will happen when you have this is that if we see this as a maybe we should just do this and then we can cover um, we can cover arbitrage in your okay so let's have this in uh, this sheet itself a little bit lower down okay all right so if we are saying that in south delhi the price is let's clean this up so remember so if we say that the price in south delhi is 40 rupees a kilo and then there's a transport cost of 45 of, of five rupees and then the price in north delhi is say 50 rupees a kilo all right so here what we are saying and the product is the same okay and since you can easily bring sugar from north to south south to bra within delhi you can easily transport the sugar okay so then what we are saying is this price is uh since these two are the same uh, identical product okay so they can't have two different prices if there is a different uh, situation that prevails like this so what people will be doing is they will just cover this so they'll just have this 
plus this and then they'll be able to sell it here and make a profit okay of 50 minus 45 all right so we can say uh, another way of using the synthetic concept another way of using the synthetic concept okay guys well, let's let's focus on our job so another way now you remember what we discussed in in options when we are talking about synthetics okay what is the synthetic equivalent of a long call position okay what is the synthetic equivalent of a long call position all right and then one minute one minute what is the problem okay so what we are saying is that the uh, the synthetic fair value the synthetic fair value of uh, sugar in north delhi should be 45 rupees per kilo not 50 rupees because i can in a synthetic way that is not the natural north delhi sugar okay <coughs> not the natural now why are we calling it synthetic because this is an artificial way of uh, giving a price for north delhi sugar because the actual price is 50 rupees a kilo but it's a synthetic price we see the synthetic fair value should be 45 rupees because i can buy the same sugar in south delhi and transport it for five rupees a kilo and so and that will only cost me 45 rupees okay so the fair value of uh, sugar in north delhi for synthetic price of uh, fair value synthetic fair value for sugar in north delhi it should be 45 rupees and therefore if the actual price is higher than the synthetic price so this is actually a case of what is called fair value modeling again you see essentially what you're seeing is what does it cost me to uh, when you're looking at now this is the market price okay now once again you can remember go back to your framework of comparing fair value versus market price this is a fair value so all these models that you have done your Gordon growth model every other model that you do in equity valuation okay those are all fair value models your project uh, IRR project NPV all of those are actually fair value models okay and they're all subjective because they're based on your subjective forecast of the cash flows of the returns we not don't want to use a specific term like cash flows it's basically returns okay which is a more general term so the those all those fair value estimates are subjective okay so if we go back now we can combine this discussion with uh, a discussion a little bit about the models so i think basically we can which i had not planned to do is while discussing this topic of convergence of futures per cash futures basis to zero uh, we might as well discuss the concept of, uh, of uh, classical riskless arbitrage okay and what is really arbitrage free valuation okay and why um, maybe we can even discuss uh, if we have I don't know if this thing is able to open it open over here um, okay we'll wait for this to open so let's um, So let's go back to the dp4 paradigms okay so what are we discussing now these are all fair value models so understand the fair value models uh, you have to always understand that what you're getting out of a model output like this it's a it's a subjective fair value assessment which is your assessment somebody else's assessment could be different okay but there's something which is uh, which always has to be uh, considered whenever you're applying a fair value model which is what is the market price because remember the market price is not subjective the market price is always objective okay like what is the market price of uh, dollar swiss right now okay you can see the market prices this okay so what is the price of um, here they haven't given the price uh, figures but if you just open this you'll see the price uh, price of crude oil okay so whenever you're discussing if you go to quotes you'll see this okay so whenever you're discussing fair value models you have to always keep in mind uh, the other thing which is the objective data which is the market price you have to compare your fair value to the market price okay that's how these models work okay that uh, these uh, the fair value is compared to the market price so you have to understand the overall framework remember that all these things these things don't just fall out of the sky now we are doing valuation okay why are you doing it what are the fundamental decision problem that you're trying to solve by yourself okay so you have to understand that those are generic decision problems which will always exist okay so the main reason you are trying to apply this kind of model the whole what is the context in which this fair value model is being applied it really is to solve the buy sell problem, which is really the problem okay this is really what you're concerned with which is why as i said uh, you have to always understand it in this way that while you're applying a fair value model to solve the buy sell problem uh, also never lose sight of the fact like 
Zhuk mounted a stern defense of technical analysis in his interview. Okay. Uh, so the other thing that you should not lose sight of is that the whole buy sell problem can be solved without any reference to fair value if you are using technical analysis because in technical analysis we generate buy sell signals by looking at chart patterns and using other kinds of indicators it's a vast field by itself you can have three courses on technical analysis including building trading systems okay so uh, so that can be so that also should not be lost sight of okay fair value always discuss market price always understand the context that is to solve the buy sell problem and also also always remember that ta is one way of solving the buy sell problem without any reference to fair value okay just by looking at uh, previous chart uh, patterns and things like that and other indicators all derived from the price okay all you're concerned with is price that's why we say ta is a value agnostic approach it's a fair value agnostic approach agnostic you understand agnostic means don't know okay so one way of defining uh, it's not very commonly defined in this way one way of defining people who are religious or distinguishing between religious people atheists and agnostics so religious people have a faith like they believe in Jesus or they believe in Muhammad or whatever but uh, atheists are convinced that there is no God okay whereas agnostics are not sure yeah, and they are not really particularly concerned with that and essentially they are saying that we are not sure okay uh, so uh, so therefore coming back to this so understand that all your NPV everything falls under this why do we call it forecast based valuation because these are all based on forecasts okay stocks you're forecasting the returns and discounting it okay so everything is a forecast project NPV IRR okay I've not written the IRR part here IRR is also should be written here maybe we can just write it here all right okay so uh, project NPV IRR all this stuff is all these are fair value models okay so always compare it with the price now what was the discussion we were having yeah okay coming back so understand that this is the context is basically I'm concerned with uh, solving the buy sell problem should I buy this asset or sell this asset okay so now come back to Del North Delhi okay So now I look at the North Delhi sugar market, okay, and ND sugar, and this is South Delhi sugar, okay. So this is, I'm looking at the North Delhi sugar market and I'm asking myself this question, should I buy this market or sell this market, okay, at 50 rupees a kilo, all right. Is this clear? Now I have a decision problem, should I buy or sell this asset? Now what, I, what do I do? One of the things I can do is apply, I can apply an example of what is actually called, uh, we have to go back here, maybe I should move it a little bit. Hopefully it's close by now. One more. All right. Okay. So where were we? Okay. Now look at this. Uh, we are going to apply. Now you'll see an example of this. Okay. And we'll make all the distinctions. Uh, we'll we'll have all these uh, discussions in in one place. Right. So what is the schema here? At the high level, we have a distinction between uh, value versus price based analysis and things like TA where which is value agnostic okay so now at the that's the first level distinction now we are looking inside this value versus price base so everything that is here is all based on this project uh, scheme of value versus price based comparison okay and remember what is the underlying decision problem whether I should buy this asset or sell this asset okay so maybe we should even make this um, fair value okay fair value versus price okay so this is our basic uh, schema what are we going to do so this we are so trying to use this now the model we are trying to use here is now actually this what I call arbitrage free valuation so here you can see within this uh, approach there are two approaches one is forecast forecast based valuation and one is arbitrage free valuation okay and arbitrage free valuation I've further divided into two parts okay <laughs> one is proper arbitrage free valuation and the other one which is improperly so called which is basically all options 
option valuation models, which are using the tools of arbitrage free valuation, the techniques of arbitrage free valuation, but it's actually not real arbitrage free valuation. And you'll understand why once you understand what is pure AFV, what is a classical case of AFV, you'll see this. Uh, and, and so we'll see this in the case of. So what we are doing is we are going to solve this problem of North Delhi sugar by applying this framework, pure AFV, properly, proper arbitrage free valuation. Okay. And what is it? How does this? Uh, so understand how this overall framework is going to work because this is a sub class of this overall framework so this overall framework how does it work we any market we look at how does the framework work this is market price and this is fair value okay so this is the fair value versus market price framework and what is the decision problem buy or sell so what we will do is we will see market price everyone can see yes. all right the fair value we have to work out for ourselves yes. using some techniques okay so we'll come up with the fair value now we've come out here with the fair value so the framework the way it works is very simple it's so simple i mean it's very obvious you may not even want to register it as a rule but it should be because you have to always think in terms of how you would talk to a computer okay for a computer everything has to be spelled out so the rule is basically that if we can write it here itself if fair value greater than market price then what should we do buy. sell or buy 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 is everyone clear i think everybody was not clear about this so if fair value is greater than market price then you should buy yes gulati are you following no, you're a little lost yeah i could see that what is the problem sir i'm unable to uh, get this concept so then you are, it's your responsibility to ask me no i'm not yeah. supposed to look at you and see that you are lost in some other space outer space somewhere it's your responsibility to pipe up and tell me you know that you have not understood where have you got stuck yeah. one minute <laughs> Yes, where have you got stuck? Okay, then you revise it yourself and come back to me with question. Okay, we can't go and like, this is the problem that if you, you say, I can't understand anything. That means you're not paying attention. That is not acceptable. You have to say that, okay, you have taught seven steps. I was able to follow till the third step and then from third to fourth, I couldn't figure it out. So that is acceptable. Okay, otherwise, you I don't know anything. You know. Okay, let's see. Let's see now. So we have a dispute. We have a dispute between. Huh? One minute. No, no, one minute. Okay. So Tanya has raised an important point. So let's figure it out. So there is a battle between Tarun versus Tanya. Okay. Yes. Huh? One minute. One minute. One minute. Let's not. Not only one person talk at a time. Yes. What is the problem? So this is right. So this is right. Okay. So maybe if you do it visually on the chart, it's a little easier. So. Okay, but let's yeah, but let's make it clear to everybody. Ritesh, you have understood. If fair value is higher than market price, then we will buy. No, fair value can be done in many ways. One sec. No, 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 no. One minute. Let's be clear. One sec. Now, Chuk has made a statement which is strictly speaking not correct. It applies to only one class of fair value estimation methods. What are all these things? These are all fair value estimation methods. Okay. So, because this, when you are in this branch of the tree, you are always using this fair value versus market price comparison method. Okay you are always going to be used so, so let's get this basic rule clear to everybody cleared up with them for everybody first then we'll come to these uh, the, i'll come to your point okay so because everything is within this branch of the tree so all of these things have to fall under this method okay and so we are it's a very obvious thing but we are still making sure that everybody understands because as we saw it was sometimes not clear so let's understand it visually with a chart it's much better if i'm looking at the dollar swiss okay 99.89 99.90 okay if i feel that the fair value of the dollar swiss is 1.02 okay now what is the idea behind fair value the idea there is an implicit idea behind fair value is that the uh, fair the market will eventually move to the fair value okay 
there is an assumption, assumption not just go up that's a specific for this particular case but when you're doing fair value based methods okay so whenever you're in this branch of the tree okay like uh, there are some people who are not, not even in this branch of the tree at all. Okay, they are always in this branch of the tree. They are purely technical traders. Okay, so this is actually not a very bad. Uh, I'll tell you my own story, like uh, how your views can evolve. Okay, so when I joined, uh, when I made up my mind to go into foreign exchange trading, I was uh, driven by this idea that because I was an economics graduate, so I would understand, I would do major macroeconomic analysis and I would forecast exchange rates. So when I first came into the trading room, I heard the story about a trader in New York, okay, who was actually trading in a new in a room with his with no news, okay. So he had blocked out all news. He had only charts. So he was a pure technical trader, okay, and uh, he was not. He was actually blocking out news because news is a distraction, okay. So he didn't want to get affected by the news, and he had blocked out everything. So when I heard that story, that this guy was trading purely on charts, I thought that this guy must be nuts okay so and then this was just when i had started out in the trading room but within six months of watching the price action that's why i'm making you guys watch the price action trade in the markets with real prices but within six months of tra watching the price action i had understood that he was right because i came now everybody may not come to the same it's a way of it it depends on how you think okay now every so many 10 other people who are exposed to the same exact same experiences that i had in those six months may come out with a different view that's because everybody's thinking differs right some people have come there are some people are socialistic some people are free market oriented the facts are always the same but it's because people's thinking differ uh, differs right so in my case i was convinced after watching six months of price action actually trading quoting prices carrying positions okay losing money making money so then i understood within six months that he was absolutely correct because why is that this is what will help you to decide between which which branch of the tree you want to go to is everyone following what discussion we are having yes, sir. Yes, sir. okay now what what made me understand that he was right is because i understood i came to this conclusion maybe we should just loosely write it here okay is this is where actually when we do the distinction between this is the merging right when we do the distinction between uh, but this is such an important point is we might as well write it here market rationality you understand what is meant by this is a very small uh, thing here but anyway we'll we'll try to make this uh, maybe eight or something and we'll just center it all right okay and here so why did i come to that if i just put here it's okay i think yeah and here in ta we assume that we say that market yeah we say it's not no it's not irrational uh this assumption is not required okay so this is what i was trying to this is why it's related to the uh, this is not big enough but when you're looking at it at home you can read it but this is the fundamental difference between what will make you a technical trader why did i switch from being a, a fundamentals based person to a uh, to a situation where i do look at fundamentals because i teach about fundamentals i have an interest in the fundamentals but if there's a conflict between fundamentals and technicals i will always go with the technicals okay always without because i don't believe that the market is rational okay so rationality you understand what is the meaning of rationality it has a very specific meaning because uh, it means that this if we go back to this rationality this is your estimate of fair value okay rationality the belief in market rationality means essentially that sooner or later the market price must come to the fair value this is basically what it means that you came up with an estimate of fair value and you believe that uh, the reason you bother to even go through this exercise of coming up with a fair value okay is because you believe that whatever be the market price today eventually the market must come to the fair value either go down or go up this is a very important belief you have to understand why do people do the things they do this because everything is driven by the belief system okay so why was i able to, why why did i switch my view because i based on my assessment of what i saw in the market i came to the conclusion the market was not rational so therefore it did not make any sense to use frameworks which require the market to be rational is this clear and what is the meaning of market rationality market rationality has a very specific meaning it means 
that it is always associated with this kind of a framework where you're comparing fair value to price and so market irrationality implies that sooner or later at some point of time okay the market must return to fair value whether by going up or whether by or by going down is this clear yes all right okay so uh, so far you have understood these are all important concepts understand what market rationality because you have to understand later on you may be required to make a choice between whether you're going to be a ta trader or you're an fa trader okay now there's also an element of political correctness in this you will notice that many people in the industry uh, if you say that i'm a pure technical trader that's not a politically correct statement okay just like in the us they have now made it politically incorrect to say that you support donald trump so many people who support donald trump are actually keeping quiet because they are afraid of getting beaten up and attacked and all that so uh, they are keeping quiet okay so because it's not politically incorrect okay so this is the thing so in the industry also you will find that there is a uh, there is a stigma associated with technical analysis that people don't like so even if they use it there are many people who use it okay because fundamentals don't give you that much clarity okay and technical is quite a precise method so many people use it but they won't say it okay so like we had in 2016 there were stories that some guys who are going to vote for trump they didn't tell their wives that we are going to vote for trump <laughs> so they would not say it but people use it but they don't want to admit to it so there's a problem so when you go out into industry don't come out very strongly especially in your early years by saying that i am a pure technical trader that may not uh, be a politically correct thing to do so you need to protect yourself in your early years okay until you become established so i would suggest while i'm telling you this that ta this is the real reason the reason you would become a pure technical trader is you would be looking at the market and you would observe all the price movements and you would come to the conclusion that the market is not rational which means essentially what are you saying in a pure form it's a very simple statement in your mind you have come to believe that there is no reason to expect now i do a dollar swiss fair value analysis and i say that fair value of dollar swiss is 1.02 okay according to me but because i'm a purely technical trader what does that mean i have i i believe i or i i, I sort of uh, i am convinced that there is no reason to believe that the market will ever necessarily go to fair value it may or it may not there is no reason to expect that what is the fundamental difference between a ta pure technical analysis person and a person who goes to this side of the tree the person on this side of the tree believes that sooner or later it has to come to fair value you see the difference between the beliefs okay there is a belief that soon it may take some time whatever okay months uh, weeks or whatever but it has to come to fair value there is a very different uh, very definite difference in the belief system are you able to follow that okay whereas a ta guy believes that well it may or may not i don't really know it doesn't i don't see any reason why it has to necessarily come to fair value okay market price can go anywhere because the market is not rational according to me okay this is clear so i'm not saying you have to subscribe to any of the things okay but i'm telling you what is the uh, you will understand you will try to understand your own belief system okay about the market based on your own uh, assessment of the evidence you have seen the evidence first hand you are watching the market you are watching real market prices okay you are trying to trade so you will form your own view about what the market is like one of the trade one of the students in amd gaziabad told me that uh, the market does not make any sense he actually wrote i made them write a report so he says the market does not make any sense which is actually fine that's a, that's an assessment right so at least he has a clear assessment that the market does not make any sense which means he probably doesn't believe that there is market rationality right so it's your assessment that you'll form your own assessment based on your uh, reading of the evidence okay which you have before you so this is the re these reason that will make you choose either this method or that method but the other warning that i'm also giving to you on a prac from a practical point of view is that even if you believe that you want to be a pure technical trader try to hide it a little bit in the industry don't come out and say i'm a pure technical trader okay because it's not politically correct okay so you say that oh i look at fundamentals and, and that is what most people say in the industry i look at both fundamentals and technicals actually i can show you why it's not very uh, it's not really rational to believe in both okay uh, because the 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 um, it's like i believe in jesus but i am also an atheist that kind of thing you know so um, is so it's a problem but this is what most people in the industry do so here i'm now teaching you some practical tricks when you go into industry what you should say to people in public is that i use both fundamentals and technicals 
that is a much more safer political strategy than to say that I believe in pure technicals. In practice, you can always, if you are a portfolio manager, let's say at HDFC mutual fund, in practice, you can always decide uh, to do what, like say I would do, let's say if I see a difference between fundamentals and technical, I would always go with the technicals. So nobody's going to examine you at such detail. Okay, what really people will go with is what you say. And so in, in practice, in public, you say the politically correct thing, which is that I believe in both fundamentals and technicals. That's a safe uh, strategy to adopt. Is this clear? Yes. So we are talking about different types of uh, inputs that I'm giving you at this stage. Okay, so coming back, maybe we lost the uh, thing, but coming back to this fair value versus so now we have already discussed this point basically they wanted to make sure that the framework is clearly understood so th whenever you're in this branch of the tree all these approaches the basic framework you're always applying is you're doing an assessment not here okay um, you are looking at the market price you are computing a fair value okay now the computation of fair value here we come back to chuk's point the computation of fair value can be done by any of these methods either forecast based value that's why i said your statement is not strictly correct because you were saying that fair value is always computed that was the impact of your statement that you were saying that fair value is always computed using these methods only that is not strictly correct because you can also compute fair value according to these methods okay and we'll see the difference between these methods and the other uh, the option pricing model as well right is this clear now you understood why i said your statement is not strictly correct so fair value can be computed by any of these three methods okay there are basically two broad methods and then there's a subclass of two over here is everyone following so far yes, they are very important discussions which you'll not find in any book so make sure these are very important for your fundamental understanding of how to use models and all these uh, forecasting paradigms okay these we call forecasting paradigms okay this is one forecasting paradigm and this is one forecasting paradigm okay paradigm is just a worldview it's a way of looking at the world okay it's a framework it's like a high level framework which affects everything that you do uh, uh, you know every perspective that you adopt okay so what have we understood here how does this paradigm work basically you look at the market price and you then compute a fair value using one of those three methods okay and then you compare the fair value to the market price okay i'm stating it in a very amazing why why are we saying such obvious things but we want to state it like we would state it to a computer you would stay you would compare the fair value to the market price and if the fair value is higher than the market price you would buy it okay why would you buy it now understand the logic once again like a computer why are you buying it because obviously because you believe yeah because because what is the belief in this in, in this branch in this branch of the tree what is the belief that eventually sooner or later the market price must come to the fair value okay and in this case you see that the fair value is lower than the market price okay uh, so in this example sorry in this example the fair value is higher than the market price and because you believe that the market price has to eventually move to the fair value which means the market price as it's moving to the fair value if you look at this chart if the fair value is here and the market price is here as the market price moves to the fair value it will have to appreciate follow this we are making it very very baby steps okay just like we would exp explain it to a computer so the logic is clear okay why are you buying okay uh, according why are you buying because the uh, the belief is that the fair value is here so the market price must eventually converge to the fair value and as it converges it will have to rise not fall okay so if you want to profit from a rising market you should buy not sell is this clear is everyone following Anika? you're following okay so is this clear now stepwise logic like you would explain it to a computer obviously for a human being you don't have to explain in so many steps but it's always better to learn as if you have explained it to a computer that makes your basics very clear basic logic should be very clear that's why you're buying because the price is going to go up because you believe that it has to converge to the fair value is this clear this is the fundamental driver of this so similarly now if we go back and apply if fair value is is less than market price so here you should sell because again because the market price has to converge to the fair value in this case it will converge by declining not rising and in order to provide uh, profit from a declining market you should sell okay so there is also an uh, uh, unstated assumption which a human being would consider too obvious but you have to state this to a computer when you are programming a computer is that the objective is always to maximize profits 
Okay, because if your objective was to lose money, then in these cases you would buy yourself. Because the computer doesn't know. If you don't tell the computer that the objective is to make money, the computer, no, human beings are going to understand that, but the computer will not. Okay, so it's always better to understand it from, uh, in, from that perspective. Okay, is this clear now? This is how this framework is always applied. Okay that uh, you're in this branch of the tree so you are always going to apply this fair value versus market price uh, comparison okay now we come back to our north delhi sugar problem now we see that the market price of sugar is 50 rupees okay and uh, we come we belong to this branch of the tree because we believe that market price market is the market is rational which means that price must eventually converge to fair value and we do a fair value competition based on the identical grade of sugar price in delhi in south delhi we find it's 40 rupees and transport cost is 5 rupees so we say that the same commodity cannot have two prices so we can actually now we can bring this south delhi sugar to the north delhi market bring it to the same location and that's going to cost us how much 45 rupees right so that is the synthetic price the synthetic fair value of uh not of not that of uh, north delhi sugar okay is 45 rupees it's not 50 rupees okay is this clear so what in this situation what are we seeing is price higher than market value or lower price is higher than market value so we are in this box price is higher than market value we are here okay so therefore what should we do we should sell okay and we should sell but we are going to do we are participating in what is called classical riskless arbitrage here okay so therefore we can't have a position left we need to lock in a profit so we are going to sell which market are we going to sell north delhi the the natural north delhi market i'm distinguishing that between natural and fair synthetic i will sell in the natural north delhi market but if i sell sugar that's a contract to exchange assets that means i'm selling sugar and buying rupees okay so if i've sold sugar then i have a contractual obligation to deliver the sugar where will i deliver it from Buy it, in the south, south. buy it in South Delhi and deliver it because when I buy in South Delhi that's a contract to exchange assets where I will be given sugar I will be buying sugar and I'll be selling rupees okay so if you see the rupee account basically here what will happen you have two accounts so you have the INR account and the sugar account okay so here you will have let's say uh, in in uh, in North Delhi if you look at it this way and South Delhi in South Delhi what is happening on the INR account uh, you have let's say you buy say 100 kilos of sugar uh, you in South Delhi and here you have minus 100 you're selling 100 kilos in North Delhi okay and you're buying 100 kilos in South Delhi and we'll just assume that just to make our calculation simple we'll just assume that the price directly is instead of factoring in transport cost we'll just call the price 45 rupees okay so in this case what you're doing you're going 100 minus plus and so this is minus 45 yes you're paying 45 rupees for 100 kilos of sugar and here it is minus 100 for the sugar account and here how much is it plus 50 okay so net if you see okay so this is how your account should look after you have engaged in classical riskless arbitrage in any base asset here the base asset is sugar okay so the base asset account should be square the base asset account should be square and the profit will show in the terms asset okay is this clear so you buy 100 rupees here sugar account goes up 100 here you sold 100 so the sugar account squares out then the rupee account shows a profit of 5 rupees is this clear so this is classical riskless arbitrage so you have identified that the commodity is identical you see the natural market price in north delhi is 50 rupees okay but then you do a fair value computation and this is how you do the fair value competition you're using actually you're using this method what you have used is actually this method pure arbitrage free valuation okay we'll explain now a little bit more uh, in contrast to option prices you have actually used this method to compute the fair value and you came out with a fair value of synthetic fair value of 45 rupees okay basically you asked yourself how can i uh, you know one this is obviously the natural market natural price that i'm looking at in the market okay the native market price but how can i is there any other way for me to bring uh, sugar to north delhi at a lower price 
is what you're asking yourself can i synthetically create a sugar long position uh, if, if if i believe that the fair value is, if, if, if so i'll be looking to sell can i kill synthetically create a sugar position in the north delhi market and the answer to that is yes you can by buying it in south delhi and transporting it to north delhi and that's going to cost you 45 rupees so the synthetic fair value of sugar in north delhi should be 45 rupees the not uh, the market price is higher than the fair value so the market price in this case is out of line with the fair value because it should not be 50 rupees because for 45 rupees we can, we can produce sugar and we can bring sugar to the north delhi market for 45 rupees is this clear okay so you are always asking yourself this question okay so here this is a case of pure what we call classical riskless arbitrage we'll use this term here okay uh, and we'll call it the reason I want to use this long term is uh, because we have uh, a lot of examples in the industry of, uh, you know, incorrect use of the term arbitrage. Okay, the term arbitrage is used in a loose sense in the industry in many cases, okay, where there isn't actually this kind. This you see is clear riskless arbitrage because there's no risk, okay. You instantly sell, get uh, get the sugar deli, uh, dealer in South Delhi on the phone and contract with him to buy. 100 uh, kilos and in North Delhi you sell uh, in the in the local market at uh, 50 rupees instantly okay and so there's no risk okay and there, if these guys don't default on their contracts you'll get the delivery okay and you can square your position and be left with a clean profit okay so here you can everything is done instantaneously and if you look at all the inputs what are the inputs here is the natural market price here this and this right so if we can put it like something like these are your three key inputs which you need to execute this arbitrage right you need to know the uh, uh, the the transport cost the transport should be freely available okay and there is no bar on moving sugar from south delhi to north delhi so you can actually make this happen so the other question you have to always look at is obviously as a matter of pra practicality you have to make sure you may see th a theoretical arbitrage okay but it may not be possible to execute the arbitrage suppose there is some kind of rule maybe not delhi municipal corporation or something has come up with rules some regulatory authority okay this could be so this could be changed to price of gold in the international markets versus price of gold in india okay the reason you can't do classical riskless arbitrage is because the government of india is putting up all kinds of barriers you cannot freely move gold freely move dollars okay so therefore there is uh, you know some kind of bar on the theoretical the arbitrage exists but you can't in the case of international gold and Indian gold okay theoretically there is an arbitrage by looking at the dollar rupee price and the international gold price we showed you the other day remember we discussed it but you can't actually make it happen because the government of India puts up all kinds of restrictions on free movement of gold there can't be any restrictions on free movement of gold free movement of dollars and rupees everything should be able to flow freely only then can you make it happen are you able to follow like you hear the municipal corporation puts up some barriers you can't move sugar from south delhi then you have a problem although you can see that the price is from south, south from south delhi if i bring it the synthetic fair value is 45 okay but actually you can't actually execute this arbitrage because the municipal corporation in north delhi has put up some barriers on the movement of sugar from south delhi so you can't make it happen if you sell at in north delhi at 50 rupees you have to deliver against this you can't bring the south delhi sugar and deliver to it deliver against the short position because the regulatory authority uh, the regulators have basically blocked it so in all situations you have to see first of all whether there is a theoretical arbitrage then you also have to see whether based on the situation on the ground can you actually are you allowed to actually make it happen is this point clear when it is when both are clear that there is a theoretical regulatory there is a theoretical arbitrage and there is no regulatory or other kind of barrier to making it happen to executing the arbitrage are you able to follow what i'm saying yes yes when there is no regulatory barrier to making the arbitrage happen then you can see clearly that it can be executed then you are actually in this box where you're following this uh, method then you are in what is called arbit this afb stands for arbitrage free valuation i don't know if i put it here where arbitrage free valuation but we can just put it here we'll just uh, i just put in a note afb stands for arbitrage free valuation so why is this arbitrage free one sec let me also explain this this is a very important principle in valuation in finance 
So this you will see one of the problems uh, of uh, many of these. Uh, so you, Tanya, you never sent me that um, that uh, syllabus of the course that you are doing. Send me the syllabus. I don't think they are covering. Are they covering average revaluation? Okay. So this is one of the problems of uh, many of these courses is that uh, they would not. One sec. Let me just merge this. Yeah. Okay. So AFV equals arbitrage free valuation. Okay. So arbitrage free valuation here, what happens is that uh, this is one of the valuation. So when you understand, when you study valuation, uh, quiet, be, pay attention. Okay. When you study valuation, you have to understand usually what happens is most of the valuation discussion happens in this column. Okay. These kind of techniques. Okay. But you also have to be aware that there are other techniques of valuation. So arbitrage free valuation is a very different technique and let's also distinguish it from forecast based valuation. Okay. Let's understand this. Okay. So first thing we have learned is that you can only be in this branch of the tree when there is no barrier that there should be a theoretical arbitrage and there should be any kind there should not be any kind of barriers preventing you from actually executing the arbitrage like here in this case the arbitrage transaction the classical risk risk arbitrage transaction is where you sell north delhi sugar and you buy south delhi sugar transport it and deliver it against the short position in north delhi is this clear Yes, everyone is clear. Okay, this is a classical riskless arbitrage case because look at the inputs that went into your valuation. Now look at the inputs that went into your one. This one is very clear. This is always objective. Market price is always objective. This is never a problem. Okay, now let's look at the ingredients of your fair value model. What are the ingredients? The market price and the transport costs. Both are known. Both are known. There is no assumption involved. Everything is known and you are not prevented from executing the arbitrage okay so this is why uh, these are all basically you see there is no forecast involved can you see this why am i contrasting this valuation method to forecast based valuation because here there is no forecast can you see that there is no forecast involved this north delhi market price visible south delhi market price visible transport cost known so in my fair value model what is this my fair value model is a very simple model even a plus b is also a model okay everything any mathematical expression would be a model so this my fair my fair value model the components the exogenous variables in my fair value model they are not based on any forecast are you able to follow this they are based on observable prices this is the price in south delhi this is the price for transport are you able to follow they are observable prices prevailing right now which i can lock into this is clear okay so that is why this is different from what you just did what we call classical riskless arbitrage okay uh, that you are able to do this and pick up this 5 rupee profit and i'll explain what afv is okay uh, but the point here is first understand the difference between are you able to follow the difference between this and this all your project NPV that you did did it involve forecasts the exogenous variables Tarun is saying none of the exogenous variables were forecast when you're doing project NPV are any of the exogenous variables forecasts yes, all forecasts so why have I called these bond stocks? Okay, there is an extreme case here, but although we saw the something has happened to this volume. Yes, sir. Yes. Should I take it out? Yes, sir. I think it'll be better. Huh? Lower it. Yeah, this is better, I think. Yeah. Good. Okay, guys. So let's please understand. These are all important concepts to understand in valuation, and it's you will not find this in any book. So better understand it clearly now. Okay. Why am I distinguish between distinguishing between these? Now we are going to we have looked at a very simple case. Uh, we can look at more complicated case like valuation of FX forwards, valuation of FX cross rates. These are all applying the strict method of AFV. Okay, true AFV. You can call it true or proper AFV. Okay. And why am I distinguishing between this? We'll come to options later. But why am I distinguishing with this and this? Why am I calling all this forecast based valuation? All this stuff that you did. All is based on forecast. Can you see that? In all of these cases, what was true? That using our model lingo once again, that the exogenous variables, one or more exogenous variables, were based on forecasts. Do you understand? Do you agree? In all these models, one or more exogenous variables, you remember now, Sarvi, what is the exogenous variable? So, which are uh, in. Uh, 
Okay, good. So in all these models, is this clear? These all these models, the Gordon Growth model, okay, your other stock valuation model, discounting earnings, project NPV, IRR, everything is it's always true that the exogenous variables, one or more exogenous variables are forecasts. Now forecasts are obviously is it guaranteed that your forecast will come true? No guarantee. Okay, so therefore there is a high level of uncertainty with these models. That's why you have so many cases of losses. People have done like 47 billion dollar mergers. They bought like there's a very famous uh, TXU, uh, which is a utility KKR and Goldman Sachs went and bought this uh, Texas utility and then it was 47 billion. It was a 47 billion dollar buyout. Okay, it was a leveraged buyout. And eventually that utility had to go bankrupt because that was a natural gas they were affected by natural gas prices okay they are adversely affected by na uh, declining natural gas prices and that's exactly what happened so in their modeling of the fair value they would not have factored in those that kind of decline in natural gas prices they thought it would be much more normal or, or uh, contained okay but in real life of course anything can happen okay so that's why you have these losses that's why there's a high level of uncertainty now notice this is arbitrage free valuation and this box okay people are getting restless yes. okay one minute one minute yes. we'll just take two minutes one sec just one sec wait 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 i won't take too much of your time i'm very conscious you need to re eat and refuel okay one sec two minutes guys so here you can see there is no uncertainty okay we locked in everything the profit is in our pocket there is no uncertainty okay now why is this called arbitrage free i'll just finish this one point and then we'll close the class why do we call this arbitrage free valuation because the technique that i used is arbitrage free valuation what did i say i said that there is i looked at it i saw that there is a theoretical arbitrage because i see south delhi markets and i see there is no restriction on executing the arbitrage so i say that okay theoretically we can do this we can make it happen and we come up with a fair value the synthetic fair value is 45 okay now if the market if so this fair value is a arbitrage free fair value because if the north delhi market had been priced at 45 why do we say arbitrage free valuation we say that the 45 here represents arbitrage free value okay uh, the, the valuation of 45 will be arbitrage free valuation okay why because if the north delhi price had been set at this level the 45 level yes if it had been set at 45 there would be no opportunity for arbitrage yes, yes? so therefore this this value if the market price is equal to the arbitrage free valuation then there is no opportunity for arbitrage that's why we say it's arbitrage free like you eat some products which have gluten free so that means that there is no gluten in that okay so similarly arbitrage free valuation in this valuation if you could set the price equal to this my valuation of 45 there is no opportunity for arbitrage there is that means there is free of arbitrage opportunities is this clear to everyone yes, sir. that's why we use the expression but this is a classical finance express expression so you should understand it arbitrage free valuation now make sure you understand why we say it's arbitrage free you should be able to explain it is this clear okay okay you can go and eat yeah yeah about PPM where you said that uh, we have to move the price limits. Uh, why don't you trade the price limits? Yeah, yeah. Exchange traded markets, you have price limits. Yeah. So, uh, then, uh, then how can you say that the markets are free? And uh, it's the same scenario like we uh, in India, we can control the stock prices. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. So, for a purist free market like me, that's why I said the advantage of OTC markets is that you don't have uh, any restrictions. In OTC markets, I gave you the example of what actually happened, okay, that uh, you had uh, where the Babuchev coup happened in 1992 and the dollar market went shot up and started moving in a very abnormal way. Like normally it trades at like uh, you know, five point spreads. It started moving in 200 point spreads. Bid and offer were 200 points apart. And the market price started shooting up five uh, you know uh, 
uh, I forget what the uh, the unit for the Deutsche Mark was. The uh, anyway, five marks, two marks, three, five marks, seven marks, eight marks. It started moving up. It was a very abnormal movement. But there was no regulator. What eventually happened was that the central banks came in and intervened. So you can have that kind of, but that intervention is not planned and it's not guaranteed. The exchange price limits are guaranteed. That if it goes to five percent or whatever the limit is, they will stop trading. So there's a big difference between exchange traded markets and OTC. In OTC, in OTC, if you see some dramatic movement, you may fear that okay, central banks will now come and intervene. But there's no guarantee that will happen. Here it's guaranteed. So yeah, you're absolutely right that for a free market purist like me, I don't believe in price limits. I don't think they should have price limits. But that, you know why they need to have it? Because remember their margins? Their margins. Yeah. So there are certain ball uh, forecasts built into the margins. So I have taken, let's say, uh, $10,000 per contract margin from you. Because I have assumed that prices will move in a certain limited way. Now if all prices start moving like fifty dollars in a day. Now that's going to throw. Then I then you may lose a lot of money, and that may, that ten thousand dollar margin is not not sufficient for me to recover losses if you default. So that's one of the reasons they do it. Okay, that limits. But also there's all kinds of politically correct rubbish going on also. That markets should not fluctuate and all this rubbish. So yeah. So for a purist free market. This is not acceptable, but because they have margins, uh, they have to. It's part of the reason why they have to do that. Yeah. So, I yeah. wanted to ask: Are there any extra decision problems for the future contracts? Like, are there any extra decision problems? Yes. Are or they are same like options and. See, the broad decision problems are the same. Yes. There are only two classes of decision problems. Either one was for the risk books, mm -hmm. which is what you guys have done so far. Your stock trading, your options trading. Equity options trading. These are for risk books. Now we are the active risk books, okay, speculative books. And then now we'll be in this project. We'll be looking at hedging books, which is which we call passive risk books. So there are the same decision problems exist, okay, but uh, some of them are automatically solved. So the generic decision problem, no. Ex obviously, the other thing is like in futures contracts, just like options, you have which month should I trade, right? So there, for that, you will typically look at volume, okay, and try to decide which is the more active month just like your options you choose more liquid contracts so those decisions because futures have many months right so you have to decide which month are you going to trade which contract are you so that that is an obviously decision problem that will remain but those are slightly subsidiary problems where what we have listed initially is all the basic generic decision problems is clear so in the case of options you obviously have strikes so those obvious additions will come but by and large, there is no generic decision problem that we have left out. But it's level of priority can be changed. Like uh, here, we have to think about which month. Like that is more important to us. No uh, yeah, you can. It's not really a priority. Initially, you typically what happens is you, you always, for depending on the contract, you will have a way of deciding. Uh, if you, especially when you are speculating. If you are a hedger, then it's different because uh, you have to decide. What uh, if you are hedging? Let's say your December crop, your wheat crop. Then you will obviously trade in the wheat uh, December contract, right? So that's a different kind of thinking. But if you are a speculator, you are generally driven mainly by liquidity. Uh, you will look at volume, and uh, here you see volume is given here. So in this case, what I will do is let's look at this contract. What what is this? Crude oil. Okay. So I look at this as a speculator. Okay. If I'm let's say so that we can look at both here. So if I'm a speculator, I will just look at this volume and I see that the Jan contract has the most volume. Okay. So then I'll just go. I will trade in the Jan contract. Okay. But if I'm a hedger, let's say I'm Exxon Mobil, I'm trying to hedge my production for July 2020. The production which will come on stream. Well, there's not even a price for that. Let's look at June 2020. So if I'm trying to hedge the production, so when you're hedging, you're hedging specific types of production: June production, May production, uh, winter the crop summer crop okay so if i'm hedging if i'm a hedger and i'm hedging my june 2020 production then i will trade in the june contract so the hedger's thinking is little different because it's based on what you are hedging okay so so you'll see that some of the decision problems are automatically solved so there are some small nuances but in by and large the large the major decision problems remain the same 
because futures is just an instrument. Mm -hmm. So it has certain quirks, like just like options. You had these additional problems of strike price and and uh, which contract, which maturity of the contract, longer maturity, shorter maturity, because that's how options are structured. Uh, so additionally, but as in, in the case of spot, you have only buy or sell. So based on the instrument, you have some additional complications. Yes. Okay. But the basic decision problems are the same. Yeah. Like buy both, buy should be bothered to invest or like buy or sell future contracts because there is a predefined date for the settlement of the un underlying asset buy or sell. But uh, it is on it is today's it is only today's money, right? Like the money which is today. So the value of money can change or with the time, as you can as you say. So that. Uh, that particular uh, contract might uh, increase in price or decrease in price or time value can change its money uh, money value sorry. so why should we bother to uh, no, 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 I didn't follow what you're saying you uh, why should somebody so why should you trade futures as opposed to what as opposed to spot yes sir Sp uh, spot or options that's what no because spot remember spot the delivery is uh, only uh, uh, yeah. two is two yeah, business days typically okay yes, so you may not be interested in that kind of delivery in certain cases when you are speculating like for instance crude oil okay think of it from a speculator's point of view you are saying you want to you have you have set up a setup where either spot or futures and you're saying why bother with futures why not trade spot but if you're trading spot crude oil you have to take delivery okay your trade delivery in that case what will happen is what will you do with the cargoes if you are just a speculator sitting at home and speculating then you are not interested in oil cargoes you're not interested in uh, physical delivery okay if you trade in futures and you get out before the first notice day or the last trading day okay whichever is earlier then you don't have to bother with physical delivery and the advantage in futures is the futures are very very liquid see advantage is see if you want to trade in physical oil cargoes you will have to call up some physical dealer like Trafigura or somebody and contract with them I want to buy then you have to talk about tanker size there are different types of tankers super max this that there are I think what three or four sizes of tankers which tanker do you want to buy what size of tanker do you so there's a lot of headaches physical oil what would you do with the oil but if you're a speculator okay these markets are very liquid crude oil is very liquid you can see how tight it is although this is North American truth right now even Frankfurt hasn't come in and you see how tight the spread is one cent spread that's why I'm saying the money value will change now with time what money value will change you mean the price price of the price of the like today the price is 50 57.84 then we have a predefined date like after one year after some time yeah it's Jan 20 yeah after some time we'll get the contract you get the delivery yeah yeah get the delivery but that at that time the price is much higher so we are at could be higher or could be lower. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But no, remember in futures the loss is going to be settled on a daily basis. So you are not even settling at the end. And remember the idea, the main reason for see there are two thinking, two ways of thinking. Either you're a hedger or a speculator. Okay. And we are not talking about market makers, we are talking only about directional speculators. So if you are a hedger, then obviously you will trade based on uh, you will trade futures because you are hedging future production. If Exxon Mobil is hedging May 2020 production it will not sell spot cargoes because it can't deliver right now it is hedging what will make what will come out of the ground in May so they're hedging this so you can see the value of this for futures for hedgers okay? for speculators the advantage is that these markets are very liquid okay these are very liquid markets so what is my objective you think about a speculators thinking the speculators thinking is that basically that I have a view on I'm just speculating on oil okay I have no interest in buying oil and putting it into the refinery or anything yeah. I am just speculating on oil yeah. so I look at the chart and I see that my view is the oil is going to shoot up to 76 yeah. uh, then what I do is for me to make money on that view yeah. if my, for me to make money on that view okay what is the best way for me to make money if I buy a physical cargo of oil I will have to take delivery and sit on that cargo till this move happens maybe the move will take three weeks yes, sir. so where will I keep that oil for three weeks so it's a lot of headache but these markets you see futures markets are very liquid so I have no intention of waiting till Jan 2020 my goal is I have a view that within the next two weeks oil prices will shoot up to 76 so the liquid most liquid way to trade oil is futures these are you can see how tight the spreads are very liquid 
okay so what i'll do is i'll just quickly buy oil futures here and i'll wait okay as the price starts moving up every day i'm making more and more money and if i'm losing money remember i have to pay my losses every day because it's a futures contract so the daily settlement right so every day so for me if i want to speculate this is the best way to do it but if Very you liquid. want delivery then it's yeah so i don't i just make sure i get out before the la uh, last trading day or the first notice day whichever is earlier so this tells me uh, it gives me the best of both worlds because as a speculator one of the things my i want to always do is i want to trade in liquid markets because in high volume liquid markets what do i get i get a very uh, tight bid offer spread see suppose i buy this at 85 and somehow i change my mind and maybe the price has not yet moved i can sell it off at 84 my loss is only 1 cent but if this was not a liquid market if the bid was say 57 70 then i'm losing 15 cents right so liquid markets are always favored by speculators because you can get out in and out at a low price low cost now you see the value of meaning of transaction cost okay if you change your mind you can get out and do the opposite trade if the spreads are tight you don't lose much if the market hasn't moved you don't lose much right so this is why people would use futures because in many cases futures markets are very liquid and they allow you to if you are a speculator they allow you to avoid having to take delivery and basically you can speculate on your uh, you can give effect to your market view your market view is going to shoot up it can happen as you've seen here sometimes this is when the oil strike happened in iran uh, the saudi tanker facilities were hit i think so that's when it happened okay so uh, so if this move this can move very dramatically so if it moves when it goes up to 76 you just square out your position uh, you pocketed your profits and you're out clean money no need to bother with oil tanker cargoes is this clear okay all right